Hi, a very good evening to everyone to the last edition of Text and Context for the year 2022. First up, we have Nikhil, who will be presenting on a federal circuit case, which is Finjan LLC versus Asset and others. Over to you, Nikhil. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be speaking about the federal circuit case, Finch Analysis LLC versus Asset LLC. So uh, basically what this case is about is there are three patents in question. The first patent, which, which we'll call as patent A, has defined a term with a first definition. There is a second patent, which we'll call patent B, that has defined the same term, but with a different, different, uh, with a different definition. Then there's a third patent known as patent C, which includes the same term, but does not explicitly defined it. Now, patent B incorporates patent A by reference, and patent C incorporates both patent A and patent B by reference. So the question is now, which definition will prevail in patent B and patent C? So to give you a background in the case, Finjin LLC had sued asset for patent infringement. Now, Finjin's patents are mostly directed to um, systems and methods for detecting computer viruses in a downloadable through a security profile. Now, patent A, which was incorporated in patent B and patent C, had defined a downloadable as a small executable or, or interpretable application program, which is downloaded from a source computer and run on a destination computer. Patent B, which had incorporated patent A by reference, had explicitly defined downloadable, downloadable as an executable application program, which is downloaded from a source computer and run on the destination computer. So the difference in the two definitions was that the term small was omitted in patent B. Patent C had not included any uh, definition for the word downloadable, but it had incorporated both patent A and patent B by reference. So when it came to construction of the term, the district court construed the term downloadable in patent B and patent C based on the definition of patent A, since patent A was incorporated by reference in both of them. Now, because of the district court's decision to include the term small in the definition for the term downloadable, the defendant then asserted that the claims for the plaintiff's patents were indefinite because what was the uh, specific range for what would be considered as a small program was unclear. And as such, the district court had granted the defendant's motion for summary judgment and the uh, plaintiff's uh, patents were invalidated for lack of uh, definiteness. Now, accordingly, the rule for what happens when a patent incorporates another by reference is that the extent of how much of it is to be uh, incorporated into the host document is a question of law. And the standard for uh, indefiniteness is that uh, the claims when read in light of the specification and prosecution history should be able to inform skilled artisans about the scope of the invention with reasonable certainty. If that's not the case, then there is a claim there that the claim should be uh, invalid for indefiniteness. So Finjan had appealed the district court's decision on two grounds. The, uh, the first uh, ground was that the term downloadable should not have the definition as uh, laid down in patent A because patent B had explicitly defined what a downloadable is and it had intentionally omitted the limitation small in its definition. Secondly, Finjan also appealed that e even if the district court was correct in his interpretation that the term small should be included in the definition, Despite that, the claim should not be found indefinite. So the federal circuit had reiterated in this uh, case that the claim should always be read in light of the specification. And this is also applicable to any patents that are incorporated by reference and that incorporated patents are effectively part of the host patent as if they were explicitly contained there. And the federal circuit also said that by incorporating a patent into a host document, that referenced patents entire contents are now part of the host patent. That being said, the federal circuit did mention that incorporation by reference 
does not convert the invention of the incorporated patent into the invention of the host patent, and that it would be erroneous to assume that the scope of the invention of the reference patent is exactly the same as that of the host patent, and that to determine the impact of how much an incorporation of reference would have on a host patent, that would be based on the context. So, the Federal Circus holding was that district court had erred in finding both definitions, that is the patent A's definition for a downloadable and patent B's definition for download, downloadable to be competing. And secondly, the district court had erred by trying to resolve this ambiguity by finding that the definition to be the most restricted definition. So the Federal Circuit found that it was unnecessary to impose such a limitation because it had found that the definitions were not competing and that there was a way to construe both the terms such that there could be harmony between them. The Federal Circuit found that uh, the examples in patent A for what would be considered as a downloadable covered applets, which would be understandable as they are generally considered as small programs. The Federal Circuit then looked at what examples for downloadables was available in patent B. And patent B had included examples such as JavaScripts, Visual Basic Scripts, and these were in addition to applets. So it is clear from patent B that there wasn't a size requ requirement for what could be considered as a downloadable. And since the examples in patent B had expanded on what was available in patent A, it was clear that the term small should not have been added into the definition for what a downloadable was according to patent B. Then the, uh, the Federal Circuit looked at patent C, which had not included any definition for downloadable, but had incorporated both patent A and patent B by reference. And in that, the court found that even the list of examples in patent C had a much more expansive list of downloadables compared to that in patent A. And as such, the, the Federal Circuit found that the term small should not have been included for the definition of downloadable in patent C. So the final holding is that just because a host patent incorporates another patent by reference, that does not mean that the invention of the host patent is transformed into the incorporated patent. And uh, the Federal Circuit did not uh, address the issue of indefiniteness because since the term small is what led to the claims to be being indefinite, and since the term small was excluded, that matter was now moot. So from a drafting practical standpoint, it would be one should be cognizant, uh, cognizant of what patents are being incorporated by reference. And in such a situation, it should, one should be aware of whether there are any conflicting definitions. And if such, then there should be some clear disclaimer in the host patent about which definition should prevail. Uh, secondly, what led to the patents being considered as indefinite was the term small uh, and as such any relative terms should be given a lot more clarity in terms of a broad range so that there is some uh, metric by which one could define what is considered as small, slow or any other relative term. Uh, alternatively, one could just omit such a term altogether because that's just as an unnecessary uh, limitation. Um, that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Next up, we have Lavanya, who will be presenting two Delhi High Court judgments. First being a trademark case, ITC Limited versus Central Park Estates Private Limited and other. And second, a copyright case, Mebigo Labs Private Limited versus Pocket FM Private Limited and another. Over to you, Lavanya. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be giving the trademark and copyright update. The first case is the ITC Limited versus Central Park Estates Private Limited and other. So basically, the facts surrounding this matter is the present suit was filed by ITC uh, for their trademark, Bukhara, which was being used for hospitality and restaurant services and which, was been, which has been in use for a very long time, since 1970s. As you can see in the next slide that the word Bukhara and its various uh, logo marks were filed all through, uh, since 1985 until recent times and under various classes, that is for the hospitality and restaurant services. 
the plaintiff had not only just used the word mark but had used this in a stylized and deco uh, stylized font which was visible on uh, various aspects of their restaurants as you can see it was uh, there on the table napkins and even on the menu it, that's on a unique wooden table and also was there present as their uh, at the entry of the restaurant which had uh, this had created a unique sense in the minds of the consumers and public who uh, who recognized bukhara and associated with itc the present suit basically the plaintiff was aggrieved by the use of the word bulk bukhara by the defendants who were also in the same business and had started a restaurant by the name of bark bukhara restaurant and they had also filed for two applications applications a logo mark and a word mark both of which were registered on a proposed to be used basis the defendants had not only uh, incorporated the name but had also used the word bukhara in their uh, logo interiors decor seating styles there was also an overlap between the staff uniform utensils menu everything with uh, with the itc's bukhara here we can see the plaintiff's trademark on the left side and the infringing mark on the right side. As you can see, there's uh, quite a few overlap between the two marks and there is conflicting confusion for the uh, consumers. You can see even the uniforms of the servers and the interior and the decor inside was also quite similar, which caused a quite a bit of confusion amongst the public and they were, uh, they were unable to differentiate between the two marks. The court basically agreed with the plaintiff on these factors and stated that the defendants have been restricted from using the word uh, from the mark bulk Kokara either in word or logo. And it has, as it was deceptively similar to the plaintiff's mark for their restaurant, hotel, or, and other hospitality services. The court further had observed, which is an important ob uh, observation made, that ITC Limited's word Bukhara is a well-known trademark, and they had instructed the registrar of trademarks to add it to the list of well-known marks. The documents that uh, ITC submitted, a few of the documents that ITC submitted to be, for them their mark to be considered as a well-known mark are important to note. These were basically extracts from the website and, you know, a few of their awards that they had won. Then they had also won um, a sing, uh, Michelin star for their restaurant. They had a lot of celebrities over the years coming up. It had it was well known as a must stop for all foreign visitors, dignitaries who were visiting India. Various newspaper articles which were being, uh, which had highlighted the restaurant's use and uh, all of the financial statements that they had submitted. So these, considering these documents, the court decided that it was imperative to include the mark as a well-known mark and had instructed a registrar to do so. Moving on to the copyright update, it's for the case Mebigo Labs Limit, Private Limited versus Pocket FM. In this current matter, the plaintiff had uh, handled the online uh, platform and apps for Cuckoo FM, which provided a platform for audiobooks, audio CDs, podcasts, etc. The plaintiff had exclusive right over the Hindi translation of the book called Mossad, The Great Mission of the Israeli Secret Service, which was authored by Michelle Bar Zohar and Nisim Mishal. The plaintiff basically stated that the defendant had a platform called as Pocket FM, whose services were almost identical to Cuckoo FM. And they had allegedly made available the subject audiobook here without any authorization from the plaintiff. And the plaintiff submitted that defendant one had violated the exclusive copyright that the plaintiff had over the particular subject audiobook. The counsel for the defendant submitted that they had removed the infringing copy of the subject uh, audiobook from their platform and they did not intend to upload it any further. The counsel for the defendants also stated that they would make sure that the subject audiobook would not be uploaded in the future. The court agreed with the defendant's submissions and stated that the book not be made available without authorization or license during the pendency of the present suit or during the copyright of the book, whichever was earlier. There was another matter that is ongoing between Pocket FM and Mebigo Labs, before, uh, which was also pending before the court. The court stated that on the uh, willingness of both the parties to uh, approach an amicable solution, and of the dispute between them, the court referred both the parties to Delhi High Court Mediation and Conciliation Center. This is a uh, this case clearly shows that how during a copyright infringement, if we uh, an amicable solution can be reached 
especially between the parties without dragging on the suit for long and mediation can be an important way to resolve such matters. Thank you. Lavanya, it might be interesting to note that few days ago, we conducted a poll on LinkedIn asking the recently the Delhi High Court declared Bukhara as a well-known mark and do you recognize this mark? So the results were interesting and the audience also would like to note. So 49% said yes, whereas 51% said no. So it's a very close gap. All right. Thank you, Lavanya. Next up, we have Harish, who's presenting on the IP updates for the previous month. Over to you, Harish. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present IP updates for the month of November 2022. Uh, first, we have uh, the Office of Controller General of Patents, Designs and Trademarks having launched a grievance portal. Uh, this was launched on, uh, uh, this was notified on October 30th, 31st, 2022. Uh, the grievance portal allows the stake, uh, stakeholders to lodge their grievances complaints to the officials of Intellectual Property Office for, for uh, unnecessary demands and for quick resolution of any issues faced by them during the processing of their application. It's a noteworthy initiative taken by the office, which will allow smooth processing and registration of IPR with the IPO. Next, we have a unified patent court update. That is a sunrise period is postponed by two months. On uh, December uh, 5th, 2022, the president of Uni unified patent court announced that start of sunrise period is postponed by two months. That is to 1st of March, 2023. Effectively, the Unified Patent Court should have entered into, uh, entered into force on 1st of April, 2023. However, this announcement has postponed the effective date by two months, that is to 1st of June, 2023. The additional time is intended to allow future users to prepare themselves for a strong authentication, which, which will be required to access the case management system and to sign documents. Uh, next update that we have is a uh, petition process for the U for the US JP collaborative search pilot program. Uh, at the bilateral meeting between uh, JPO and USPTO held on uh, November 8th, the two parties have agreed to implement a single petition form. As a result, the applicant can participate in the US JP CSP program by submitting a single petition form either to one of the offers. Uh, next, we have uh, major amendments to national IP legislation, Vietnam. So uh, this will come into force on 1st of January, 2023. Uh, major changes in the IP, I mean, Vietnam's IP law are uh, introduction of pre-grant opposition process, wherein uh, this, uh, this allows any third party to file a request for opposition within nine months from the publication of the application. Uh, prior to this, third parties could have challenged only based on observation to the patent office. Uh, the third party observation, which uh, which is uh, included now, will allow parallel uh, parallel uh, opposition. Uh, that that is uh, pre grant opposition process, which is being included now, and the observation process, which was previously done. Uh, the second uh, amendment being additional grounds for request requesting invalidation. Previously, uh, there were only two grounds based on which uh, invalidation was being done in uh, Vietnam's, uh, according to Vietnam's uh, IP law. Those were uh, patent where the invention did not meet the requirements of patentability. And the other was the patent was granted to a person who was not entitled to it. So according to a new amendment, there are additional four grounds where uh, a patent can be invalidated. Being an application is based on traditional knowledge or genetic resources, but does not sufficiently disclose the origin of genetic resources or traditional knowledge. And the invention has not been sufficiently disclosed. Third one being the applicant has uh, submitted amendments beyond the scope of original subject matter. And the other one being the invention does not meet the first to file requirement. So the next amendment uh, with respect to Vietnam's IP law is uh, use of foreign examination results. Here, uh, the patent uh, patent law allows examination results of other uh, uh, foreign applications to be considered during the substantive e examination of Vietnam's uh, patent application. 
நெக்ஸ்ட் வி ஹவ் யூஎஸ்பிடிஓ அனௌன்சஸ் கேன்சர் மூன் லைட் ஷார்ட் மூன் ஷார்ட் எக்ஸ்பெடேட்டட் எக்ஸாமினேஷன் பைலட் ப்ரோக்ராம் திஸ் ப்ரோக்ராம் Uh, this program basically allows qualifying technologies that is uh, health health and medical fe- medical field uh, uh, to have the applications reviewed earlier and this program is ke- scheduled to run until january 31st 2025 or date by which the uspto accepts a total of 1000 grantable petitions whichever is earlier so this is uh, coming into enforcement by february 1st of 2023 thank you thank you harish that was really informative next up we have naika who will be presenting on a topic disco dancer the musical i will leave it to naika to introduce the case further good afternoon um so the disco dancer the musical uh, the case name is after shemaru entertainment limited versus saragama india limited and others uh, this case this present suit was filed by shemaru for uh, in context of hindi feature film the disco dancer so this film was released in 1982 in india um the facts of the case are that shemaru international shemaru had approached the bombay high court seeking interim relief restraining saregama from exploiting the rights of the movie disco dancer so shemaru claimed that they acquired rights to the film through an agreement in 2011 and had rights over all the intellectual properties including the theatrical rights so a uh, few days uh, shemaru uh, on in november first week of november they came across a preview of a stage play disco dancer the musical on an instagram post is um, shown here so they they saw a instagram post by saregama official on their saregama official page showing that they were going to do a stage show of the disco dancer using the same script and same characters so the uh, shemaru uh, they filed a interim injunction uh, restraining saregama from staging the performance the stage uh, the show was scheduled in london on 16th november 2022 and hence um, shemaru filed a suit in first week of november the present judgment was uh, the present judgment was given on 15th of november 2022 restraining shema restraining saregama from uh, using the uh, using the intellectual property but just because um, already already the preparation for the show was done it allowed the saregama to stage the show further uh, we'll discuss the contentions by saregama uh, saregama argued that there were agreement in reg- there was agreement in regards to the aforesaid film the disco dancer and the rights in the said film in favor of the predecessor that is gramophone company of india uh, earlier in 1982 and all the rights of ip were given to them by the defendant number 3 that is the producer of the film saregama also claimed that an agreement executed with defendant number 3 that is the producer pertaining to the musical theater uh, theatrical adaptation of the said movie in 2019 so they claimed even after 1982 in 2019 they again came into an agreement and executed for musical theater and adaptation of the film saregama also claimed that the agreement of 2011 with the shemaru the producer of the film and shemaru states that they had assigned only rights in cinematographic film of disco dancer and not rights pertaining to the adaptation or staging of the musical or drama saragama also argued that shemaru had approached the court at the last hour to restrain saragama and that the theater in london had already booked for a week and the production cost had reached a figure of about 4.34 crores involving number of artists thereby involving uh, the artists and all the um, performers already present at the uh, location and uh, this would be great injustice uh, if the stage if the staging has been restrained uh, i'll also like to reproduce the clause from shemaru's agreement and later on i'll produce the uh, 
a clause from the Saregama's agreement. So Shemaru's agreement read um, clause four specifically talked about the intellectual property rights. They it mentioned that it was given in the virtue of uh, negative rights. Negative rights here, they de defined as sound and picture of the said film. The assignee shall have all the copyrights, IPR, which are derived from the negative sound and picture of the said film, including without limitations, uh, 35 mm, 16 mm, 8 mm, and all over all other reduced and enlarged sizes, digitized formats, cinema, cinema scope size, commercial, non commercial, theatrical, non theatrical, recording, embodying, communication, processing, publishing, public exhibition, distribution, exploitation, mechanical synchronization, telecast, and so on. Uh, they in this uh, particular clause, it also mentioned it also gave the rights for remaking rights, uh, remaking rights, translation, adaptation, story, dialogue, screen plays, scripts, songs, lyrics, scenes, description, sequences, and all the components thereof. Merchandising rights, DSL, ADSL, VDSL rights, wireless telegraphy rights, and all other residuary rights and format which may be introduced, invented, or developed or discovered during the perpetual permanent and forever period solely and exclusively by mean, by any means and whatsoever manner or method throughout the contra uh, contracted territory or territories of the whole world universe planet including india uh, this this particular agreement was executed in 2011 with shemaru by the producer it also mentioned that all rights recovered by the Copyright Act 1957 with all present future amendments and those that may be discovered or developed or invented or introduced in future and all IP rights of all the nature and all rights available in any other statute. In short, all the rights which otherwise would have been with assigner were sold, transferred and assigned to the assignee as that of the owner's negative right holders. The assigner hearing will not have the single right left with him as the absolute ownership of the negative that is sound and picture rights has been sold transferred assigned to the assignee under this agreement um on the other side the clause from saregama's agreement which was signed in 1982 um <clears throat> it was specifically in the context of contract recording and contract work so <clears throat> One of the clause of the agreement mentioned the producer hereby assigns and transfers and agrees to assign and transfer the company transfer to the company absolute and beneficially for the world one that is copyright for making records of all contract works which are made available to the company under the term of this agreement and, con and the copyright performing right and all the rights titles and interest in and to the literary dramatic and musical work embodied in producers film all rights of publication sound television broadcasting public performance and mechanical production reproduction of the said work second the sole and exclusive right to make or authorize the making of any record embodying the contract recordings either alone or together with any other recordings. The producer agrees that all the rights and obligations under this agreement shall be construed to apply to this work included to be included uh, in the producer's film commenced or under production during the period of this agreement. So the findings of the court after reading the both the agreements um, before finding of the court, I'll, write, I'll like to even mention that after 1982, the same right um, was given to Saregama by its predecessor, its uh, its predecessor uh, defendant number one, that is Gamma Phone Company Limited to Saregama. And in 2019, uh, Saregama and defendant number three, and also the defendant number two of the case, um, they came into an agreement specifically for the reproduction and uh, for the theoretical rights of the particular theme, particular movie. <clears throat> the court found that prima facie the rights assigned in the state to agreement in favor of Saregama pertain to recording of performance of musical nature and soundtrack. Although the agreements in favor of Saregama in 2018 and 19 do refer to adaption rights and right towards musical theoretical adaption of the aforesaid film, but all the agreements are subsequent to the agreement executed by defendant number three in favor of Shamaru, which was signed executed in 2011. When defendant number three had already assigned all the rights, including IP rights, theoretical rights, and other rights pertaining to the state film in favor of Shemaru, any such a subsequent agreement executed by defendant number three claiming to assign adaption rights or right to stage musical would be paled into insignificance. <clears throat> the court held. <clears throat> 
um, the court held that the uh, ad interim relief was granted in favor of Shemaru in restrict in restricting Saragama from infringing the assigned rights of Shemaru. But the court didn't find it justice to restrain the show from staging as the theater as in uh, as the all the th all the theater in london was already booked and it was specifically stated on behalf of uh, sare gama that the production co cost of about 4.34 crores was already been incurred more than that there were artists who upon being engaged had practiced and perhaps reached the venue for staging so it would be also injustice for them the second point which was held was the court further directed Saregama to deposit the entire collection from staging of such shows to the appointed senior master of the court within two weeks. The court also gave liberty to Saregama to apply to this court for release of specific amount towards expense incurred for engaging artists and other supporting staff. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Naika. Next, we have Sushma, who will be taking us through patent statistics for the month of November. Over to you, Sushma. Thank you, Kavya. The patent and industrial design statistics for the month of November is presented here in the graph. Uh, in the month of November, a total of 5,113 applications were published out of which 2023 applications were accounted for early publications and the other 2,990 accounts for ordinary publications. It is notable that the Delhi Patent Office has the highest number of patent publications with the 705 early publications and 1,250 ordinary publications. With respect to patent examinations, a total of 3,089 patents were examined, out of which Delhi Patent uh, Delhi Patent Office accounts for highest number of examination with 1,288 FERs. 638 FERs were issued from Mumbai Patent Office, 996 FERs were issued from Chennai Patent Office, and 167 FERs were issued from Kolkata Patent Office. Last month, 2,335 patents were granted, out of which 879 patents were granted from Delhi Patent Office. It was the highest. And 392 patents were granted from Mumbai Patent Office, 796 from Chennai, and 268 patents were granted from Kolkata Patent Office. With respect to industrial design registration, Indian Patent Office registered a total of 1,127 industrial designs last month. All the data presented here were collected from 44th to 47th issue of Indian Patent Office Official Journal. For the weekly statistics, check out Banana IP Delhi PDIP News Center. Thank you. Thank you, Sushma. Next up, we have Meeta, who will be presenting on Dairy High Court judgment. FMC Corporation and others versus GSP Crop Science Private Limited. Over to you, Neeta. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'll be presenting uh, the Delhi High Court judgment on FMC Corporation and others versus GSP Crop Science Private Limited. And the decision came on November 14, 2022. Uh, so the plaintiffs in this case are uh, FMC Corporation USA and its two group companies, FMC Across Singapore Private Limited and FMC uh, India Private Limited. And the defendant in this case is GSP Crop Science Private Limited. And in this case, plaintiffs seek an uh, injunction restraining the infringement of Indian patent number <clears throat> IN252004 titled uh, method for preparing fused, fused oxazinones from orthoamino aromatic carboxylic acid and a carboxylic acid in the presence of a sulfonyl chloride and pyridine. So this patent relates to an intermediate which is used in the manufacture of chloranidiprol, which is abbreviated as CTPR, uh, which is an insecticide product. And this patent was originally filed in the name of uh, plaintiff predecessor DuPont. And this uh, company DuPont was later acquired by uh, the plaintiff and uh, all the patents were assigned to the plaintiff wide assignment agreements uh, with an effective date from November 1st, 2017. So in this suit, in this suit uh, plaintiff seek, uh, seek an injunction against defendant from utilizing the method or process claim, claimed in the suit patent for manufacturing and selling of CTPR.
So the background of the case is uh, the defendant uh, in August 2022, the defendant obtained an approval from Central Insecticides Board and Registration Committee for technical indigenous manufacture of uh, the insecticide CTPC, CTPR. And uh, the plaintiff got a knowledge about this approval and they filed a request under RTI to obtain the details of the manufacturing process, which is adopted by the defendant for uh, manufacturing CTPR. And uh, for this, CAB and RC sought a consent from the defendant for disclosure, and this was denied by the defendant. So the plaintiffs appointed an internal expert who analyzed the defendant's process based on a report which was publicly available at that time. And after analyzing the report, the plaintiff concluded that the manufacturing aspects disclosed by the defendant are identical to the process or method covered by the suit patent in terms of the starting material products and coupling reagent, which falls within the claim one of the suit patent. Uh, and uh, this case was listed for the first time on 23rd September, 2022. And the court appointed a local commissioner <clears throat> to visit the manufacturing facility of the defendant and ascertain the process being used by the defendant for the manufacture of CTPR. Accordingly, the commission was executed and he filed the report on 19th October, 2022. And in, in meantime, on 31st October, 2022, the defendant submitted before the court that it had obtained necessary approvals for the launch of the CTPR product. And uh, since this insecticide is a seasonal product, it prayed for permission to launch considering the matter was pending adjudication before the court. So the court uh, considered all the submissions made by uh, both parties and uh, made uh, and dismissed the, uh, dismissed the application seeking the interim injunction by the plaintiff. Uh, considering uh, several grounds, uh, which include evergreening, prior claiming, invalidity, and suppression and uh, misrepresentation of facts. Uh, so uh, the court observed that the suit patent is prima facie invalid due to prior claiming. Uh, considering the following facts, uh, on 8, October, 8 January 2004, DuPont, which is the predecessor to the plaintiff, uh, filed the CTPR process patent, which is uh, numbered IN332, with a priority date of 13th August 2001. And in this uh, application, the plaintiff had identified benzo benzoxazone as a target intermediate, which is useful in the manufacture of CTPR. So they had disclosed this in the patent application, but it was not claimed at the time of filing. And in 2005, uh, benzoxazone and the process for manufacture of CTPR using this intermediate was claimed by the way, way of an amendment taking priority from 2001. And the suit patent, which is being considered by the court, was filed on 7 December 2004 with the earliest priority date of 31st July 2002. And from this, it is evident that this is a subsequent patent. So the court observed that the differences which the plaintiffs seek to highlight between the two patents, the suit patent and the a patent which was uh, filed by DuPont are completely farcical in nature and are merely <clears throat> and are merely cosmetic differences aimed to confuse the co uh, situation. Thus, uh, prima facie, the suit patent is hit by prior claiming. Uh, the court also observed that the suit patent is prima facie invalid and liable to be revoked based on uh, these observations. The process of manufacture of benzoxazinone or even fused oxazinones was completely disclosed in the patent specification IN332. And the same process was used in the suit patent for uh, producing benzoxazinone leading to CTPR. So the suit patent also contains identical examples from IN332. So the court observed that uh, this cannot merely be a co coincidence. Therefore, this court is convinced that this is nothing but an attempt by the plaintiff to uh, extend the monopoly beyond the life of IN332 under the garb of slight differences and usage of broad terminologies in the suit patent. The court also observed that there was a duty cast upon the applicant in the suit patent to have informed the examiner of the monopoly granted on claims in IN332. This duty was not fulfilled by the applicant. So based on these grounds, the court observed that the suit patent is invalid and is liable to be revoked. And another observation made by the court was the plaintiffs are guilty of evergreening the CTPR exclusivity because the earliest priority date of the suit patent is 31st July 2022. And going by the priority date, 20 years of the patent have lapsed. 
and the invention has not worked in India. And also the uh, plaintiffs have uh, more than, uh, they have filed more than 30 patent uh, families which have been filed by the plaintiff uh, seeking patents on different aspects of CTPR such as process, ingredients, intermediates, etc. which if granted would result in a monopoly and exclusive right till 2041, which means a further period of 19 years. So the court observed that in the opinion of this court, filing of such multiple patents for different aspects of the same product with an intention to extend the initial monopoly in some form or other would not be permissible. Undoubtedly, multiple patents can be filed for different aspects of a particular product if the test for novelty, inventory steps, and industrial applicability are satisfied and the inventions are patentable. However, serial patenting in order to evergreen a particular monopoly is not permissible. This would also clearly constitute an abuse of patenting system and curb legitimate manufacture and sale of such products in India, especially if most of the patents or inventions are not being worked. And the court also found that the plaintiffs are prima, prima facie guilty of suppressing material facts and misleading the court and the patent office. This is based on <clears throat> uh, these facts that uh, the corresponding European patent had lapsed in 2007 but in a rejoinder filed when submissions were heard, plaintiff continued to mislead the, mislead the court by submitting that the patent was granted in several uh, jurisdictions in Europe, including France, Germany, Switzerland. So this is factually incorrect. And uh, the Japanese patent application was rejected in 2009, but plaintiffs in the form three submitted to the Indian Patent Office claim that the corresponding application has been abandoned. And uh, Plaintiffs also in the submissions before the court uh, claim that the suit patent is commercially very sad. But this is in stark contrast with Form 27, uh, which they submitted, where it is categorically admitted that uh, the product is not being worked in India. And considering uh, the submissions, the court also found that it is not possible to arrive at a conclusion that the process of defendant is infringing at this stage because fused oxazinones are known as per disclosures of uh, made in the previous patent IN332 and the process for manufacturing the same is also known. And the question whether the process of defendant is different or can uh, or not can be conclusively established only after the uh, technical experts have given the evidence. So the court observed that even before embarking on the question of infringement, the validity of the suit patent would have to be established, which at this stage is clearly in doubt. So uh, the uh, court also observed that the present case appears to be a classic case as warned by Supreme Court in a Novartis case where plaintiffs seek to search for the defendants who could be sued in order to prevent commercial launch of CTPR product in some manner after the product and process patent have expired, and that too by placing reliance on an intermediate patent which has not worked, which is prima facie invalid, and whose term is coming to, a, coming to an end in a few months. And <clears throat> the court also considered the fact that the balance of convenience is in favor of the defendant, which is stated to have obtained approvals from the relevant authorities for manufacture and commercial launch of CTPR, and irrepar ir <clears throat> irreparable injury would be caused if the defendant is not permitted to launch the manufacture and sale of CTPR in these facts. So uh, with the above facts and circumstances, the plaintiffs are not entitled to an interim injunction and the application for interim injection is accordingly dismissed with a cost of uh, two lakhs and the set cost should be uh, paid within four weeks to the defendant. And the defendant was also permitted to launch the manufacture and sale of CTPR on the condition that uh, an account of sales is maintained and produced on a half yearly basis during the pendency of the suit. Thank you. Thank you, Nita. And with that, we come to the end of Text in Context. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And see you all next year and wish you all a very happy Christmas in advance. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today.